Hi, Mickey Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. Today, we are at the Oasis Academy, Media City, UK, in Salford, to debate one very big question. Should we be proud of the British Empire? Welcome, everybody, to The Big Questions. <laughs> well, the British Empire once covered 13 million square miles and held sway over 458 million people. It was the largest empire in history. The extent of its territories across all the continents coloured the maps pink and created an empire on which the sun truly never set. But across the 20th century, its power waned. Uh, most of its nearest neighbour, Ireland, fought and won the right to self-rule in 1922. The imperial jewel in the crown, India and Pakistan, gained independence in 1947. Britain's new impotence was evident over Suez in 1956. And then, country after country in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Far East went their own way. All that's left is the British Commonwealth, plus a few windswept outposts and tax havens. Looking back now, was the British Empire something to swell our chests with pride or something to be deeply ashamed of? Well, we've gathered together entrepreneurs, historians, faith leaders, commentators and activists from across the Commonwealth to debate that question. And you can join in too on Twitter or online by logging on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions. Big questions and following the link to the online discussion. Plus, there'll be lots of encouragement and contributions from our very lively and intelligent Salford audience. Should we be proud of the British Empire? Good morning, everybody. Charles Allen, historian and writer. Lord Curzon, the Viceroy of India, for it was he, uh, said, the empire was a supreme force for good in the world. Yes, he says uh, it was the greatest institution in the world has ever seen. He said, you know, to me, the message is hewn in rock, it's hewn in stone. You know, our work is righteous and it shall endure. Uh, and, of course, it didn't endure. And really, the question is, was it righteous? Was it righteous? And I think we, we have to say this is like the curate's egg. It's good in parts. But I also think we need to clarify there are two definite models here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, going back to the, the Greeks and the Romans, now, the Greeks, their concept of, 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 of imperialism was the colony. Your little island is not big enough to find somewhere else to live. So you move and you settle and you become independent. And the other model, of course, this is the one that really, I suspect, is what upsets us, is the other model, like Rome, where you become uh, e extremely predatory. You attack the Sabines and you take their women, you attack their Etruscans and you gradually expand and eventually you end up exploiting a weaker nation. And then you... Which you model were we? And we are a mix of both, precisely. Mm. We've got places like Canada and Australia, and indeed America, I suppose you could say, where, in a sense, the, 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 the local population was not big enough to, to resist. But look, look, you, you mentioned Australia. Look, yeah. look at the, the genocide of the Tasmanian yeah. people, what we did to the Aboriginals and Maoris. And uh, look, at the, look at the atrocities. Do they not mm. outweigh any good that may have come from... I mean, look, I mean, you know, the, the, it's a hall of shame, Charles. The, the Bengal famines, 1769 to 73, under the aegis of the yeah. East India Company, there, 10 million people died because of uh, willful incompetence. Massacres at Amritsar and, and uh, I mean, in atrocities in Kenya relatively recently. How can we be in any way proud? I think by today's standards, we cannot. Today's standards, uh, right. Yeah, we cannot. Uh, but nevertheless, what we have to do when we actually look at it, and particularly me as a historian, we have to set it in some kind of context. Yeah. And if we're talking about British India, we have to say, what was there before the British came? What was there in other parts of the world when the British were there? And what legacy did they leave? And really, it's there that we can pick out what, to me, are straws, because my family very deeply involved in British India. Um, you know, my father was one of the last uh, of, the, of the civil service to, 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 uh, to rule over India. I actually, I'm a child of the empire, I saw it in action, and I saw, in a sense, the best of it, because here I saw one man, my memories of him are very strong, sitting on the veranda, as it were, dispensing justice. Paternalistic, uh, you called, might call it dictatorial, impartial justice on a model that seemed to work very well. But he, but I, as I say, that is the good aspect, but of course there are other aspects too. There are, and we shall explore uh, both sides of the uh, imperial coin as we proceed. Dr Anita Ghosh, it's interesting, and what Charles says there is interesting, it's all about the context, and perhaps um, we are rather value-led when we look at the past, and value-led history is bad history. There were atrocities, there were appalling things. What were the good things? Well, the good things um, were also there, and like Charles, I agree, it is, it's, it's hard to draw any line there. We are 
we are, we are organised in the form of a debate today, so we are encouraged to take sides. No, no, listen, um, listen. You can agree with each other, that's fine. We're looking for genuine enlightenment. But uh, in, in terms of the good things, uh, uh, I think um, the, the infrastructure that was left behind by the British in India, which were built for reasons of exploitation, for reasons of extraction of resources. No altruism. Uh, no altruism there whatsoever. One of the byproducts, I think, is the infrastructure that was left behind of the empire, which you could say uh, gave India an added benefit in 1947, um, which propelled uh, us into, into the modern age. But I see that as a byproduct of empire. It isn't as if it was put in place there for the good of the people. I mean, the railways, for instance, which are very often cited as you know, one of the best things that the British left behind, you know, they were there for the extraction of resources. If you look at the way the railways were planned, in the 19th century. They were directly connecting the ports to the hinterlands. That was the sole purpose. They were not connecting cities. They were not connecting towns. They were not connecting people to pilgrimage centers where people would have loved to go to. But they were built in a strategic way, functioning as uh, arteries of extraction. When you look back as a, as a British Indian. exploitation. Yeah, as exploitation. When you look back as a British Indian, are you um, angry? Yes, I am. What are you most angry about? Um, the, the way empire functioned, the way it was set up, it was a hugely unequal power structure. Uh, a sovereign state went in to invade another sovereign state by virtue of its military might, by virtue of its economic power, and that fundamentally was unfair. And everything else that emerges out of that is a direct uh, a result of that process. So at the, at the moment, the moment at which, you know, Historians have, uh, as I'm sure some of our, my colleagues would know, historians have called this the absent-minded empire. It was not an absent-minded empire. Mm. People went in knowing what they wanted. It was, it was very well structured, very well organized. Otherwise, how could a handful of people from millions of miles away construct such an effective system? Uh, which was the British Empire in India. David Vance, what are you proud of? Well, I mean, I am proud of the British Empire. And I think just if you look at it in the, in, in the general context of in 1897, I think, the year of Queen Victoria's Silver Jubilee, uh, Britain controlled about 25% of the world. What a remarkable achievement for these little islands. And the fact is that were this an audience of Italians celebrating the Roman Empire or an audience of Spanish, they would be proud of their empire, but we're not supposed to be. Is there, anything, think, is there anything you're ashamed of? From a, 19, uh, from a 2016 perspective, lots. But as you, you just said, Nicky, that you know, if you're going to have revisionist history, that's very bad history. At the time, in the moment, the British Empire uh, achieved lots of good, and it leaves legacies which bring lots of good. And that needs to be said loud and clear. And we should, you know, the, the, the revisionist argument, trying to apply our standards in 2016 to things that happened hundreds of years ago, in my mind, is folly. Oh, interesting. No, people were horrified at the time about many of these crimes. And, you know, to give an example, Ireland, half its population either died or fled uh, because of the potato famine in the 19th century. Uh, whether it be, there's a brilliant book by a guy called Mike Davis called Late Victorian Holocaust. And it, it looks at how when tens of millions of Indians were starving to death in the middle of the 19th century, the British were exporting grain yeah. and leaving them to starve. These are crimes of historical proportions. And what I'm frustrated about this debate is we talk about, you know, we have so much actually to be proud of in our history that we don't talk about, like the people who fought for our rights and freedoms, the people who fought for the right to vote, for the welfare state, against racism, against homophobia, uh, for trade union rights, workers' rights. That's a history we should be proud of, not a history of subjugating the world and invading it for their reason. <laughs> subjugation. Going into other people's countries, taking their resources, subjugating them, very often dehumanising them, and very often killing them. Yeah, yes, and empires rise and empires fall. No empire, to the best of my knowledge, has been ever perfect. None of them has provided utopia. There's plenty, like the Soviet empire, for example, that have provided nothing but the, 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 the genocide of millions of people. I think, as empires go, the British empire was, generally speaking, reasonably benign. And I think to characterise it in the way that you say, Owen, for example, ignoring the fact that were it not for the, the Royal Navy, would the slave trade have ended? 
Well, it's funny you should say that because... Like well, hang on, Charles Allen. <laughs> Charles, Annan, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll save you, Charles Allen, because Anne and Dieter, I saw you a couple of times wanted to come back in. You were talking about the value system, and yeah. I think that's absolutely essential in our sitting in judgment of our empire today. And like you said, you know, what was going on then in, 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 in the late 19th century in, in, in Africa, you know, with the Mama massacres and everything, this, these are contemporary concerns of those times where we, this is where we need to make a distinction between the Roman Empire and the British Empire. <coughs> post Enlightenment, you know, given this is the post humanist period, you know, we're talking of an age of liberalism, we're talking of an age of humanism. How could empire be justified even by those contemporary standards? So, this is not a 21st century inflection of our values mm -hmm. onto the empire in those days, but by contemporary standards, this is post humanism. Can I talk about. <laughs> Charles, you can, and there's a lady right behind no, you. Go on, I, I, go I, on. Are you. Are you deferring? Yes, of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be with you right up. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> well, the values and truth remains truth, whether it's in 18th century or 21st century. One human should not exploit another human, full stop. So whether it happened in 18th century, 19th century, or today. So I would say that... It's an absolute truth. It is an absolute truth. Yeah. But, uh, but, Charles, but, Charles, but, uh, you know... Um, isn't empire the default position of history? We are all, we are all, uh, you know, uh, the legacy of some empire. Everyone on the planet is. We had the Roman Empire, Phoenician Empire, the, the, the Arab Empire, the slave trade and the Islamic Empire. I mean, and on it goes. Should we be beating ourselves up about this? I was, if you look at history, it is essentially the exploitation of man by man. Yeah. The part of the do. strong. So really, you have a question of you know what imperatives. Now, if I can, uh, if I can just look at the 18th century, which is when the British come onto the map in India. Yeah. Now we have uh, two, three empires essentially. We have Aurangzeb, the last of the Mughal emperors. Now he tries to rule India with one standard law, which actually happens to be Sharia. He brings in a whole series of rules, which essentially uh, discriminate against the Hindus. Now the other model we have are the Sikhs. Now, the Sikhs under Ranjit Singh are trying again, but they're essentially, nevertheless, a predatory empire. They're expanding, and they again have another model which essentially draws on an even earlier system, which is the caste system. The caste system, now, I, uh, Sikhs would disagree with me, I suspect, but yes. I do this deliberately because <laughs> we, have of, uh, we have the Hindu model. The Hindu model is deeply did, racist. Did we exploit the caste system or did we try so and get rid I'm of the caste system? what I'm saying is that when the Brits come in, the British do try and have the idea that the law applies to all equally. Okay. Now, this is a new model in the Indian context. And that there are advantages in that, which is today to this day, the Indian Penal Code is developed by Macaulay in the 1830s, and it is still functions today. All right, Jack Raj, you come in here. Andrea will be right with you. I mentioned the caste system there, and you sort of were agreeing with the, uh, as I posited, uh, the, 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 the fact that it was exploited by the British uh, ruling elite. Jack Raj, first of all, uh, what's your, when you look back at the British yeah. Empire, what, what do you think? What are your feelings? Well, uh, I grew up in India uh, mm. till I was about 11, uh, and I can tell you that just coming back to the point there, the fact is that. Uh, now, a lot of the voices that were unheard are coming out into the fore. So when we look back now, it's from, from a balanced, more balanced viewpoint. We can look back and hear the voice of those that were actually exploited. And we can realise, actually, no, it wasn't so good. Uh, and here, it, what we're seeing now is that the propaganda of the British government is now... You know, the power back then was so powerful. When they were, when they were, before every movie, they'd have, like, you know, these cheering natives thanking the British Empire. And it was all designed to make people here feel good that actually this was a force for good. And that, that, uh, that viewpoint has endured even though it wasn't real, even though the people didn't want to be exploited. And many, many Indians fight, uh, fought against the British to get them out of India, but that viewpoint was kept quiet. And the point that was sold to the British public here was that this is an empire that is actually designed to, as a force for good. And what I find worst about this is that that viewpoint now, looking back 100 years later and hearing about all the exploitation, all the murders, and we can still sit there thinking, oh, no, there must be something good about it. And I think it's kind of, yes. this is fake. It isn't comf it's not real. In reality, the people never wanted to be exploited. Many, many great nations were destroyed. So it's by unmitigatedly the negative. There are no, there's not a case of, because you hear this a lot, mixed feelings, love, well, hate. You, you know, there may be something good about um, yeah. getting shot in the back, but, you know, uh, and you, you might say, well, some good came out of that. We can struggle. We can look around for a few uh, straws here and there and say, well, you know, we had a benign rule or, uh, you know, that we made some railways. But in reality... It was a very exploitative system. Dr. Lavani, Carter Lavani, you would come back, back in yeah, on this. Yeah. Actually, it was during the British rule when all the castes, cultures, and the races, religions worked together for the first time in 5,000 years. It, it, it goes back to the, the caste system. Is that because back. of the British it was rule? The first time under the British rule. They worked together in the army, 
all the untouchables and then everybody worked hand in hand for the first time. Really? So was the railways, yeah. railways again hundreds of thousands, post, post and telegraph, hundreds of thousands worked mm -hmm. together. There's no problem. It was the, actually the first time in the, also uh, because they were, India was a conglomerate of many kingdoms. And that's the British worked them together and they had a time, took time to collect, put them all together and uh, conquered other kings. So a sense of yeah. nationhood almost was... Uh, yeah, in in India was actually, it was British who created India. There was no India before. Out of a conglomerate of many kingdoms, they brought, made one India. And that was a good thing. Yes, very can good. Can I thing. ask you as well? Do you, do you think? Can I ask you, Dr. Lavani? Yeah. Do you think? And you do hear this sometimes, and it's a it's a contentious thing. But you read it and you hear it when people say, ultimately, uh, in terms of social progress, uh, the British Empire in India was uh, a civilizing mission. Do you, do you believe it, that? It, it certainly was. It certainly was. I, I, most, most certainly. Most no, certainly. I think most the certainly. British Empire because destroyed. I'll let you come back in a second. I'll let you come back in a second. Explain right. what you mean. Yeah. Look here. Yeah. Most certainly, he should know better than anybody else. He's sick, you know. But I don't know what, he, what he's saying. But let me tell you. It was the first time, first time, the, the burning of uh, the sati. With the, Widows. The widow only burned with, with husband's pie, right? And there were thousand years, there were many kings, not one, but one king ever bothered to do anything about it. And the British stopped it. The British stopped it. And not only really just British, but the British company stopped it. The company took a great risk by indulging into social uh, matters, you know, which the kings did not bother before. And, th and this is and the I point, that, that, that to look at it in black yeah. and white is actually wrong. It's, it's, it's a more, you have to have a more nuanced view. David, we did David we, let me just, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll get Jagras to come back in, because Jagras yeah. is extremely yeah. exercised. Lawrence in a second, and I, David, I, I will I, let I, you come back. I, I, My I, goodness, I, everyone I, wants to speak I, to I, me. I, I, it's very good to be here. And Andrea too, yeah? There are a lot of social reforms, you know, including the infanticide, if the girl is born, the, the British the, the, stopped infanticide. Yeah, I stopped it. It was banned, you know. So a lot of things. And uh, the, the most of all people should appreciate more should be Mr. Singh, you know. Mr. Uh, Singh? I, I don't understand. Yeah. Are these inconvenient Mr. truths, these, uh, these uh, the civilising influences and examples of social progress? I, th I think what we're seeing here is somebody, a mindset, which is basically the <laughs> colonial mindset, where when people who have been programmed to believe that people are coming here to exploit you for your own good. Yes. And they, don't, they look past the exploitation, and they think, oh, well, they gave us a few things. Let me just go back to all those two points that they raised about sati and about female infanticide. Well, firstly, the gurus banned that. So what we're seeing is that the, the, the empire that the British, that there's the Sikhs built, the law for every Sikh, and I, I'll take issue with that for that reason, for a Sikh, it was totally against the law, something made by the gurus in the 17th century mm -hmm. to ever have sati or to have a, ever have in, female infanticide. Um, and, and issues like this make me think that actually we had a very high culture um, and then we were told, oh, your culture was actually terrible. And in fact, it was amazing. The Sikh empire never had any capital punishment. So oh, we had an empire that was so Charles big. Charles Allen. And yet How nobody was... Ranjit Singh's no... wives had to, had to commit sati. But Ranjit Singh was, not, a, Ranjit yeah, Singh yes, was not the right. epitome of that's Sikh right. religion. Think... He, in fact, was called to account by the Sikh So he was the, the Sikh, Sikh empire? No, he was, he was the king of a Sikh empire, but he was not seen as an exemplary Sikh. He was punished by the Sikh authorities themselves. He was pulled to be whipped by the Sikh empire in Amritsar. Just clarify your... Clarify... Hold on a second. And Andrea, I've got your... You know, I'm coming. I'm coming. But like, just cl clarify what you're saying. Well, I'm just saying, if you go to Lahore, there you will see the imprints of all the wives of Ranjit Singh, who when he died, who when he died had to be cremated on his funeral pyre. That, now, that, that does not, not sound... Be. They chose to be. Just to make that point, I've tried the history, oh, they chose to be. So that's a good thing. But, it's, it's a good thing. It, but listen, we're not here saying that Ranjit, we're not judging Ranjit <laughs> no, Singh. You're, you're the British defending Empire. Sikhism yeah. as being anti sikh So Sikhism versus Ranjit that, Singh are two very different that, things. That, so that, 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 and, 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 listen, that, uh, listen, that, that, everyone, that, we're, we're, into a, we're, we're into a very, very uh, rich theme with this debate, I feel. Lawrence Rees. Well, first of all, we... Sorry, Lawrence James, I do beg your pardon, Lawrence. First of all, we seem to be examining the tree rather than having a look at the forest. We've got odd incidents of injustice here, a hospital opened here, so on. I think take it's a very important the context to come. Yeah. The whole empire I take to be the forest. Mm -hmm. And I think we put it in context. During the 18th and 19th century, there are two, several revolutions in Europe, an intellectual, a scientific, and an industrial. And they give Europe, what I might call Western Europe, certainly a preponderance of power. At the same time, there is in Europe an enlightened movement to say we should share these things with other people. And if you like, when the first, a banal example perhaps, but the first cinema opens in India in 1896, this is a very simple example of the sharing of knowledge. 
Now, that is quite important. It's quite essential. The fact that there were a lot of cads and scoundrels and rascals <laughs> running this empire is certain. We will all agree on that. There are also men of virtue and integrity and honesty. Of course. <laughs> and I think we should look in that general position of the empire is transforming the world. Uh, quite an amazing transformation. Ultimately a force for good? I think a force for good, but there were some villains hanging around, yes. Mm. There are in all a human institutions. Yeah, indeed so, an engine, an engine of change. There is a phrase that the, the sun never set on the British Empire because the Almighty couldn't trust what the British would get up to in the dark. <laughs> there was, there was a, it, was a, it was certainly a, a playground for many. Uh, Femi, let, uh, Andrew, one second. But Femi's try, trying to come in here. You, you, you've been responsible for the campaign to get rid of the Cecil yeah. Rhodes statue. Do beg your pardon, Andrew, but I, I will be with you. What so, so we had a Join bit, us. We had a bit of talk about the instrumentalisation of the um, caste system in India under British colonial rule. The British Raj was actually a model for the use of the House of Fulanis in northern Nigeria and indirect rule there. Um, the British Raj was, the, was the, the model for a lot of what happened later in the process of colonisation. You mentioned that there are legacies of empire. I would say that the Darfur conflict and the recent civil war in Sudan is a legacy of the fact that you split the Arab North and the black African South into two segments and developed the North whilst leaving the South. And the British are entirely responsible for that? I'd say that the British are largely responsible. Before, there was, there was conflict in Sudan before mm. the British came. There was not racial conflict. There was conflict, but it was not as heavily along racial lines. Now, there are... I thought the northern parts of the Sudan uh, were preying on the south in that the Sudanese slave trade, which General Gordon uh, helped destroy, relied on the north, the Islamic north, taking people from the there tribal are, regions to the south three, and selling them into Egypt. And there are on. three segments. You have animist and Christian black Africans in the south. Mm -hmm. You have in the middle Muslim black Africans and you have the north Arab Muslims. And it was a Muslim animist conflict mainly before the imposition of Christianity in the south and the Kind of but people make their own decisions to, to rape and to pillage and exploit, uh, no, whether that be the British or whether that, uh, they don't make their own decisions. People, people, no. people make that, like, this is the same argument of the fact that there's so much crime in um, black America is due to the fact that there are primordial tensions for these, it's, it's not, it's socio-economic and structural inequality. And in the same way... So the Janjaweed militia, we're saying it's not our fault. Well, no, if you, if you look at um, most um, conflict in, in Africa at the moment, and you look at most um, ethnic conflict, a lot of it is due to... Um, poverty. A lot of it is due to uh, people. Uh, um, Boko Haram, a lot of Boko Haram comes from mm. um, Almadjuri schools, which are impoverished schools in northern Nigeria, where hundreds of kids have to go out and beg. I mean, I've been to Kaduna and yeah, seen yeah. them myself. So the rape of resources and the, the rape of resources, drawing of, of those things. straight lines I mean, on the map. It, hey, David Vance, do you want to come back in here for a bit about that, Andrea? Well, no. I mean, just to, to revert back to what we have been talking about a couple of minutes ago, it did take the British Empire to stop the burning of widows in India. And whilst we talk about so many other things, that was a clear, demonstrable advance of civilization in that part of the world. And had it not been for Britain, it wouldn't have happened. Andrea. Yeah, I'm... I... I'm sorry to have been so long before coming <laughs> Thank to you. Thank you. Yeah, going back to this whole thing around civilising mission, um, I think what we have to understand is that even in the 19th century, the British felt they had to justify what they were doing because it was known to be inherently wrong. So the emphasis on things like the abolition of sati and I'm not going to defend burning widows for a second and I'm not sorry that they abolished it and I have problems with the idea of voluntary sati so I'm not I'm well, not defending so was that, it good that they did, but was it good I don't they have a problem but that's good, not why we was it were a good there thing, yes, that's no. not what we were there for though but, but was it a good thing that was a byproduct was it a good thing that was a byproduct of our being there was it justify the whole rest of the Andrea was it a case then that there were there were good people there there were noble minded people there because humans are you know we're complex creatures who saw this and thought this is wrong and who, in very, very good faith, sought to and succeeded in absolutely. abolishing it. You give, do you give those people I, credit? I absolutely would absolutely. give those people credit. Of course, in any no. place, in any time, there are good people and bad people, and there are people yeah. who are working yeah. from good intentions and what they believe to be good intentions at the time, and also those who are willing to sort of undertake yes. nefarious acts yes. to, to uh, personally profit or profit the nation. Of course there's good and bad. Rose, in just one that second, said, to talk about the spread of religion. That said... I don't, I don't <laughs> think that we can take a few examples of civilised emission. I mean, Sati affected maybe 500 widows a year. Yeah, but, there are oh thousands of pages what, of parliamentary... What's 500 deaths? <laughs> five even, even, thousands of pages of parliamentary papers on them. Yeah, None at all on hundreds of thousands of people who died of famine. Professor Lovani. Civilisation. Yeah, I think it is it is far far more to be appreciated that the authority who stopped it was a company 
And company was, was solely responsible to directors. It did, it the East India not, Company. It's not, yeah, yeah, not their yeah. business to do what the kings could not dare to do in India before. And they did it, took courage to do it. This is, it's a very great, very great achievement. It's, it's really much, it's not just normally stopped, you know. An early manifestation but, but they, they were globalization. Very, <laughs> yes, yeah, they yeah. were strongly advised. I think what you're seeing oh, here is the best of, best of British values, you know? and, and we can't say that Britain has no good values. I, I joined British. the British Army, yeah. uh, I spent four years, I believed in British values. Yeah. I do think that the current Britain we're living in now does have, at the best, very good enlightened values. That is not to say that we, we look back in India and, 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 and find a few little good things that we did and then say, well, the whole thing oh, must have been good. <laughs> the reality is, <laughs> there's some terrible things that were done, Dr. Uh, the, the just good knowing. They did. The good things they did, I don't know where to start from, you know. There's so many, one after other. Railway was, um, I have a 20 chapter book of doing good. The railway is only one. The rest is, is comes about 20, one after other. Now, you see, judiciary, what, what judiciary was before? And the judiciary. Civic society, judicial yes, system, you talk about those, yeah. uni yeah. First university in India was built by British. The Empress of India, Queen yeah. Victoria. Yeah. Yeah. She never yeah. went there, did she? Yeah, but you see, <laughs> the, 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 the first also. three universities were built by the company <laughs> itself. <laughs> Oh, okay, 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 listen everyone, listen everyone. Um, Fanny mentioned the religious there in, uh, in Sudan, animism and, and Islam and Christianity. Let's talk, let, I'm sorry? Not, not only in Sudan, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think you mentioned and, 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 uh, it. It brings us actually on nicely to talking about religion and uh, uh, <coughs> the missionary, missionary position, if you like, uh, spreading... <laughs> I wish I hadn't said that. Spread, <laughs> spreading, <laughs> spreading the word, spreading the, 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 the good word of the, of the Lord. Yeah. That, that wasn't a good thing, though, was it? You were, you were destroying people's cultures. I'm not saying you were, Rose, but no, people's no. cultures were destroyed. Absolutely, I would agree with that entirely. And as a Christian, I want to say yes to Christianity, but at the same time, recognizing that along with Christianity, people brought their own culture with them. And of course, you know, people had their own religions where they were. And the, the audacity of the British Empire to think that we know what is right and you know yours is no longer important or valuable <laughs> and you've got to have it. but, but so, it, you know there was health and education some of the the longest serving establishments in terms of education and health brought were, were brought through the Christian medium there so it, it, it is not so much another curate's egg well, whatever you may call it. But the, the reality is we cannot just say, I personally, with my hand on my heart, cannot say that I am proud of the British Empire. Because it, it, and I'm not just looking at it through rose-tinted lens. As it were. As it were. I, I really do believe that some awful things were done. And you mentioned about um, the, the British uh, demolishing slavery. They, they didn't. It was the people who were being enslaved who were making slavery unworkable. <laughs> Fred, Rose, what that does is that, that sim simply uh, contradicts uh, the fact that the British Navy was the instrument to ensure that the slave trade was eventually... It's a matter of historical fact. How can you deny history? Just you don't like Let's go to the audience. Let, you know, some, some arms have sprung up in the audience. You first, sir. Good morning. Yeah. It was a con. The Navy actually took Africans and indentured them on the Caribbean to work just yeah. like slaves. But that's a, that was yeah. a bad thing. They also took many back to Africa, again to endure poverty and trouble. So, in fact, it wasn't a good thing that the, the, uh, the Navy did. Not at all. So Don't believe that, brother. So, had it not, had it, so, so you, would have, you think that had the Royal Navy not sought to stop the slave trade, it would have magically no, they stopped didn't. Anyway. No, 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 no. They actually encouraged it in a sense of using those same Africans to do what the planters wanted. Well, hence, that was the, the point. hence, of course, the, the, the Jamaican Rebellion, which was uh, some years That's after right. emancipation, yeah. because of the disappointment that emancipation had not made a difference right. to their lives. And that That's was very right. brutally May put I down. See... When, when was it? It was the 1860s. 65. 65. 65. Yes, sir, right beside so, you. Yeah. It, this gentleman here wants to pr uh, promote this image of uh, some utopian British Empire and then talking about a Soviet dystopia. The uh, in Caribbean was a dystopia for the Caribbean people, the Africans who were transported, as the gentleman said. And you're trying to present this position about the Navy cancelling slavery. I'll tell you who stopped slavery. It it was the Africans who, for hundreds of years in the Caribbean, rebelled violently against their own gods. At the same time, granted, there were a lot of people in the UK who fought for abolition as well. Mm -hmm. But don't posit this position, because from the, early, from the late 1500s until 1833, there was that forced migration of 20 million people, plus all of their descendants, forced dehumanisation, rape, a movement of culture, and an eradication of culture, for you to then try and say, oh, the Navy stopped it, it's frankly, historically disingenuous. Yeah. Well, can I come back and answer this? Yeah, I'll be on a few in a second. Finally, about the Navy point. 
the French wars of the early 19th century when we were fighting the French, it was partly just, to, just to, an excuse to attack French ships. OK, we've abolished slavery. The people here have abolished slavery. Mm, how can we attack the French? I know the French who, yes, granted, it was your other Europeans who were transporting slaves across and who cancelled their own slave trades after, an excuse then to attack French ships, because when we're at peace with the French, we can't just attack them. But since we don't yeah, like slavery yeah. anymore, we yeah, can attack any, fr any ship flying French colours. You read the historical parliamentary papers. The excuse, essentially, let's yeah. attack the French because they're, uh, we're in a time of peace, but they're carrying the flag. So don't try and posit the Navy as this great humanization force when it was that same Navy who enforced that policy of forced migration of people for 350 years prior. But I'm not suggesting. <laughs> excuse, I'm not me. Suggesting. Hey, excuse me. Do you want to come sit in the front row? Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> I'll just replace it. I'll let you come back. I'll let you come back. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, go just, on. just a Andy. quick one. I think we Andy. need to put this in context. We have to also understand that while all this debate about abolition was going on, 40% of the contemporary state, state budget was given to former slave owners as, as, as compensation. 40% of the contemporary state budget. That much amount of money was at stake here that was given over to the slave owners. Why did they need to be pacified? Why did they need to be paid compensation for exploiting people's lives? Well, of course, yeah. it, it wasn't oh, just... Don't. It oh, I mean, I mean, somewhere at the end of the, the slave trade, it's like a man going on a killing spree and then saying, oh, I don't like killing anymore. You wouldn't pat him <laughs> on the back for it, would you? But the, the point, I just wanted to bring up a point about cinemas, which I thought was quite a curious point, because it is possible to have cultural exchange and to share culture and ideas without conquering much of the world and inflicting famines but which kill tens of millions. I think Lawrence, to be fair, said it was a trivial example. But and the, and the final point, just the final point. Let's, let's rub out irrational, but do carry on. And the, and the final point, <laughs> it is this argument that somehow that again, which is we're applying 21st century yeah. standards to the past. In the 1950s, there was the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya against British rule. And the British Empire responded brutally, killed thousands of people. Well, it was it hushed up here, wasn't it? Ah, but there were people, I'm just making this point, mm. people spoke up against it. Do you know who one of them was? That well-known lefty Enoch Powell, who condemned the British brutality in Kenya. The point I'm making is this. There were people, there were people who stood up against this brutality, and it is a disservice and a smear on those people at the time who fought for the freedom of people to say that they did not do so and were just applying yes, the standards. Yes, but the broader the point here, the, the broader point here, which some don't seem to uh, seem to have rather overlooked, is no one's arguing that the British Empire was a model, a utopian model of empire. There never has been a utopian model of empire. Let me finish my point. There's never been a utopian model of empire. The very fact that the British Empire did contribute towards the, uh, in, in the in the mid 18th century towards the stopping of the slave trade shows that it was a more enlightened empire than many other ones that existed but you're not that here to whinge about that uh, you agree with that do you i think i think the arab empire was far more brutal yeah uh, yes. i want to make just one point though the thing with the arab empire because the sikhs suffered from both the british empire and the arab empire yeah. the thing with the arab empire the sikhs knew was is that these are our enemies we're going to fight them with the british empire it was it was a bit more nuanced how they tried to do was it they tried to change the sikh religion so the arabs never really tried to change the sikh religion and try to twist it to, to suit them it was just straight out, it was clear. Full they're on. Your enemies, <laughs> yeah, they're, you're fine. With the British, it was very much a case of take a religion which is very independent, very free, very freedom loving, and try and convert that into something which you can use for your own benefit, convince these people to join the British army, convince them that it's for their own good, and then use right. them to then subjugate other Indians. So I, I wanted, think I, I wanted the to British were far more you know, subtle. They were, not, not subtle, they were yeah. far more insidious. Insidious, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Dangerous. Lawrence, um, let's talk about decolonization. Yeah. There's things I want to return to as well, you know, the Christianization as well because that's left it's when we come on to talk about legacies that's left some people argue some very negative legacies and it's tearing apart the anglican communion at the moment with very conservative christianity homophobia rife in the west indies and in africa and jamaica but lawrence let's talk about decolonization and generally those you know sitting down in those straight lines drawn on the map in africa and no understanding of tribal or ethnic complexities in that continent i mean i suppose you know, e empires have been historically rather short on foresight, but we made some terrible mistakes there, didn't we? Um, well, I'm not sure. African <laughs> states... To, no, let's think of it. If there were... Uh, how many African states are fighting boundary wars at the moment? Uh, quite a few, actually. You have a lot of insurrections. Well, then they will fight them, but uh, let's well, forget wars, about the boundaries. I think that, uh, that's slightly irrelevant. What is relevant is that in the British Empire between 1939 and 1945, the British government asked for the assistance of the subjects of empire to fight the Second World War. And this generated a powerful sense of reciprocity. Uh, a large number, well, I think Indians and Africans knew what Hitler and Mussolini had in store for them. It was very nasty. 
So uh, they fought, and at the end of the war in 1945, a lot, thousands upon tens of thousands of them, in the French as well as the British Empire, came home and asked the question, we have risked our lives in a fight which we have been told, and rightly so, I believe, was a morally good cause. Mm -hmm. What do we have in return? We have been fighting a war for freedom, uh, the, three, the fourth of freedoms of President uh, Franklin Roosevelt's, uh, the Atlantic Charter. What share are we going to get of the spoils of this war? And I think that's the first thing in the background to decolonization. Thousands and thousands of Africans uh, uh, with an educated elite and ex-soldiers were asking the question, um, this freedom we fought for for five years, when is it coming to us? And the British government no, turned round and said, well, I think we've got to consider decolonization. Uh, in 45, uh, Labour government comes to power, promising it India, Pakistan. We've no money, so we like yeah. it. That's yeah, the yes, exactly. they won it. And, and it was a manifesto. The Labour said, we will give uh, independence to India, uh, Ceylon and Burma. And this was in the Labour manifesto, and of course it came about in 1947. They go further into saying this will be extended to Africa. No one could work out quite what the timetable would be. Uh, the 1990s was given uh, until 1950. And then something else happens in 1945, and I'll, I'll cut off here. We have the beginning of a Cold War. Yes. In which newly independent countries are going to find that the Soviet Union and the United States are competing for them. Mm -hmm. They are coming along and saying, join us, vote for us in the United Nations, we will help you. And the Finnish 1954, uh, an African ruler of an independent country, uh, Abdul Gamal Nasser, Colonel Nasser, uh, wants weapons, and he asks Khrushchev for weapons. And Khrushchev says, I will give you MiG fighters, I will give you tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I will make Egypt strong to fight, uh, in this case, uh, Israel, but also to resist any encroachments by Britain. And then you have Africa decolonizing at the same time as the uh, Soviet Union and the United States are looking for world power and confronting each other. And so we're rather uh, irrelevant. Uh, well, Britain does become irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. But, and interestingly, of course, Nasser, there are, there are, there are arguments, uh, yeah. well-sourced arguments, that that secular regime of Nasser, the reaction to it, has uh, led to many of the seeds of uh, Islamism yes. and the problems we have there. One thing leads to another, basically. And, uh, can I ask you, because you've been trying to come back in, and in Dita, um, if you were, if we talk about 46, 47, the, uh, uh, India's... Uh, freedom, if you were to have to drawn, uh, to draw a map, to draw a line on the map and to have done it better, what would you have done? Over to you. <laughs> God, so you are, uh, I have been put on the practice. spot. Haven't you have to be put, you're, you're, it's better than Mount Batten, that's what we're looking for. Here. Well, I certainly would have taken more than two weeks to draw that border. I, I, I think, you it's know... It's a mystery I, I question, think, isn't it? It is, it is. Um, so if, if I can slightly uh, evade that question and come, come at it through it's another before. angle. There, there's uh, there, there's so, so many things just being bandied about in this debate that I want to get back to. One is, uh, you know, the idea that Britain gave India independence in 1947 is a myth. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think we need to get over that. So, so uh, you know, this, so all this civilising that we had been doing for all this period, you know, we did all this great great good to the people and this was the time when we felt that India was right to be uh, handed over its, its freedom and and we left it didn't work like that Britain was in a terrible mess in the post-war situation and, and it, it might have been in the Labour manifesto for obvious reasons but it was also a question of this was becoming a very expensive colony to maintain it just could not have happened the Congress showed itself as downright uh, you know non-cooperative during the Second World War and this was the last straw this was the time when they were absolutely sure that no more kind of cooperative talks could go on between themselves and, and, and Britain. So from, from the point of view of the Indian freedom struggle, it had reached its, its, its head as well. So, you know, this had to be solved. So it, it was internal pressure as well. So it wasn't just the war and all the aspirations for liberation that had been, you know, kind of suddenly uh, sparked alive in people mm -hmm. that this led to, you know, this is, a, this is a freedom struggle that goes back to 1885. It isn't suddenly the Second World War, which is creating all these aspirations no. in people. You know that, no. that 
line. So can we talk so about that line? Can, can, I, can I just quickly finish? So, you know, that, that is one myth we, we, should, we should get over. And, and, and I, I, if I can return to what Dr. Lalwani was saying earlier on, the idea, again, that the nation itself was a gift of Britain to India does not absolutely hold true at all. It wasn't Western education. It wasn't railways. It wasn't the civilizing mission that did all of this. But it was the mm. presence of the British in India. It was the anti-colonial nature of the struggle that brought India together. So the British contributed to the Indian nation, but by just being there and being what they were, which was an oppressive colonial regime. But, yeah, let's, look, let's talk about legacy as well, not just de de decolonisation, legacy of, for example, in Africa, we paved the way to apartheid, didn't we, David Vance? Uh, uh, many of the, Femi touched on this, many of the problems in Africa uh, today are down to uh, how we behaved, what we did. Shouldn't we hide our... our um, heads in shame because of No, I, I don't think that the problems today, right now today in Africa... But our attitudes to can, race... Can, can, be, can, ..can be laid at the, ha at, at, at the door of an empire long since gone, Nicky. I mean, it's we, we, people have to accept responsibility for themselves in their own but, independent but countries. But black people are, today are still suffering because of the, trade sl <coughs> the slave trade, aren't they? I, I, which, which, of course, is being carried out by, by, by other uh, rising empires, such as, for example, some of the, uh, in, in terms of the Islamic empires that uh, we see cropping up. No, we cannot be carrying the consistent guilt over everything that isn't perfect in every part of the world. You know, we weren't a perfect empire. I've not said that we were. Did we make mistakes? Yes, we did. But we done good. And as regards Africa, I would simply raise this one final point. When, uh, for example, Zambia, Zambia, uh, whenever it was part of the British Empire, uh, and, and we ruled and governed in it, the average Zambian uh, had an income of about one-seventh of what we had here. Mm -hmm. All these years later, what do they have? One-twenty-seventh of the income we have Who's here. Whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? We've gone. Who's responsible? Femi, who's fault is that? Okay. Oh, Femi, uh, so much uh, Rose in a second. Yeah. Femi. Femi. Personally, I, I don't think you can separate us being the fifth richest country in the world from our colonial past. And I don't think <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> Um, sec secondly, there's a few points I want to make. First one is on Owen and um, what he said about the Mau Mau insurrection. We keep talking about this civilising mission. Um, how is bringing civilization to a culture, systematic internment camps of 1.5 million people, rape, anal rape of men with snakes and scorpions and knives? Um, you, have, you, have, you have women, um, pregnant women shot... You have, you have kids um, when the British went to um, Australia. Are there atrocities in all Pardon? empires? Pardon? Are there atrocities in all empires? There, well, no uh, there are atrocities in the French Empire, there? there are atrocities in the Belgian Empire. There are atrocities Empire. in all empires. And there are, but they were not atrocities. I, I, these, these, beings, people, these people were not, were not writing about liberalism in their parliaments creatures. at the time I, I, and freedom I, I, and There equality. are atrocities in all empires. But, yes, there are. Um, but yeah. not, that not all empires call themselves civilising missions. Um, well... Moving... Everyone else is killing people, so we're doing as well as not... That is the well, who's saying that? No, but, but, yeah, but, yeah, the argument is uh, anyway. But and then, then the other point I would make is you mentioned um, how many wars are there in Africa at the moment in a kind of flippant way. The British media does nothing to cover the Congo Civil War, the biggest war since World War II. It doesn't look at it. The British media did not look at the Angolan War, which went on, even though it was not a British ex-colony, no, but it went on for 40-odd years, which is two-thirds of the extent to which some of the last colonies were, and then you're there saying it's not that long ago. 60 years is, in, is, not, a, um, is not a very... Long time, long time. In the great yeah, span of all. history. In the yeah. great yeah. span of history. Charles, history. we haven't heard from you for a while. Charles Allen, Rose in a second. Conflict. We're going to talk about legacy. Charles Allen. I think there's an awful tendency to simplify. The fact is that we do not study this period, uh, and indeed in many countries which are newly liberated or have been liberated from 1947 onwards, and I use that word liberated, it is a liberation, um, they do not study anything rather than the, the freedom movement. India is a classic example. If you ask people about what happened uh, in, the, in the 19th century, People will not know because this freedom movement has now become... We need national myths. We need founding myths. And I can understand why every country, whether it's Kenya or mm. whatever, needs to uh, portray the freedom struggle in the most positive terms. But it's, it's all ambivalent. There are, there are nuances here which are being missed. In the question of Mau Mau, for instance, how many other tribes beyond the Kikuyu got involved? How much of that was actually about land grabbing by the Kikuyu? How much of that... How, who were the victims? Other Africans? Who were the main victims? Very few Europeans actually got killed by the Mau Mau. 
So it's not simple black and white, this is history. My worry is that now we're getting a black and white history, but there are so many nuances involved in this. Yeah, I, I, and, 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 and the great delight, nuances are the great delights of history, aren't they? Let's talk about legacy. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 Rose, I, 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 you can I come guess, in without me even yeah, asking just, you a question. Yes. I would like us not necessarily to go away feeling guilty about the atrocities of the British Empire. What I want us to do, however, is to acknowledge that there were these major, major <laughs> issues that, that, is still, that is still impacting on us today. So, for example, by virtue, for example, of paying the slave owners and, and, and giving nothing to those who were the victims of it, have left people still in that victim mode by virtue of um, taking away a people's culture, um, uh, killing who they are, still exists today. And that is why the racism that exists in, 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 our, in our present time exists because we still think we are white, we are great, yeah. black, yeah. you're not good enough. But, it, 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 but it's not, this is, well, it, can I just say something? Yes, so this, this is, this is wait, the legacy. This, it, this, it, this, we see this happening all over the world mm. from sets of one set of human beings towards another set mm. of human beings. We see, the, we see the Chinese Empire, the rape of resources in Africa from the Chinese yeah. Empire at the moment. There are still the American Empire, the Chinese Empire. There will always be empires. There will always but be human beings doing British terrible Empire. things. Yeah, we are discussing the British Empire. Which, yeah, do you think it has a uniquely... A pernicious legacy because of the slave trade, yes. because of the racial aspect? It, it, it is there. We, we cannot yeah. deny it. It is, it is still there. Why is it that our children today do not learn about um, cultural things of their particular groups? Why is it only what is Eurocentric or British? But how can, can we take upon ourselves a type of collective guilt, people watching the, you know, today? Can, should we feel guilty? Guilt is are, useless. Are, guilt is yeah. useless. Are, are, we, are we responsible in the way we spread Christianity for homophobia? I was listening to a documentary the other day about homophobia in Jamaica, and they were saying, look, you gave us the Bible, you gave us the truth, and we believed it, and all of a sudden you're telling us not to believe it. Well, I, I, I would agree that that is wrong. I would never condone that. But the point that I Are want we responsible to... for it, spreading those attitudes back in the 18th century? Yes, I think century. we did. We did spread those, and, and, and we are reaping the legacy so, so, so of it do, today. So do you think the spreading of Christianity was wrong, therefore? It's not so much about the spreading of Christianity. It's what we packaged it in. But, Rose, Rose, but I just want to explain something else. Wait, simply... those, okay. those, those, there's, there's a very strong argument that we are responsible for the spread of homophobia and spreading those attitudes, but there have been generation after generation to change the penal codes, and they haven't changed the penal codes. So can we still put the blame at our door? I, that is a very good question. I think we are very much still under the the umbrella of it, as it were, yeah. of that painful time in history. Still very close in the great I, I, I think span so. of time. You know, <laughs> yeah. Audience, audience, yes, look, you've had your hand up for so long, for long and I've, I've been trying. There's been, been, been a lot of nonsense talked this morning, and I think the saddest <laughs> thing is... You should come every week. Yeah, the saddest <laughs> thing is, I think, I've seen this morning is the typical British way, where the two Sikhs have been arguing the most. I find that interesting. <laughs> we talked about how the British went, they were non-civilised, let me tell you, that we had, you just talked about the Mughal Empire preceding the British Empire, they were more than civilised, they, they didn't need you to come in, Sati is not an Islamic principle, but let's modernise it. As a young British Pakistani Muslim, what we're talking about now angers me the most. Muslims are always told, you don't integrate, you're not involved. Black people are always told, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, there's something about your culture, you're criminals. You need to follow this way of life. The reality is the British Empire is the biggest reason that racism exists today in this country. When you have people like this on the front row who will always see black, brown, Asian people as being below them, we subjugated you, we owned you at one stage, we, you can't get above your, above your level. Yeah. How dare you get anywhere? They what, keep you at your the level. Mohammed. Mohammed, one of the arguments you hear is that one of the positive legacies of the British Empire is our multicultural society. It's not working, is it? Because there's a multiculturalism to an extent. They always want to keep you at a level. They don't want to uh, progress. So let's talk about what, we, what, what do we do next? Well, it's interesting in your intro, you talked about India and Pakistan being the jewel in the crown, literally the jewel in the crown. Mm. You still got the jewel in your crown. We want it in back. my crown. No, in the in the Queen's <laughs> crown. The British, the British, the British. The British. You're British. So, no. it's the yes, jewel British. in your crown. No, 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 no. no. It needs to be returned. It needs to be returned back to the people you stole it from. I want no, reparations. I, I, from anyone. I want reparations. No, 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 OK, that's, they're the ones so who turn, turn it, it up. We turn it. Return it certainly it. shouldn't go to Lahore, but it's in a very few years, it should, because it's gone to hundreds of rulers and conquerors over the centuries. The idea that these little simple tokens, that's not enough.
No, it's not. Let, it's not. It's not. Let me go back there education. to that's that's that, that gentleman there. You've, you've been, yeah, you, you. Good morning uh, to you. Good morning. Hi. Uh, well, quick point, yes. very quick point. Well, about, I, I just needed a minute. Uh, what I want to say is I've heard some of the most preposterous comments today made by many panellists. Which one? one? Which one most of all? <laughs> Mainly from this side. <laughs> <laughs> but what, the, what, we started as an India with a nation. Nationhood was given by Britain, thank you. <laughs> yes, but that was, uh, uh, and then there were infrastructure that was laid, whether it, it was Indian, P, uh, Indian Penal Code, Indian uh, Post Office, or Indian Railways, Indian Army. These were all central to the development of the, uh, the empire. The, the infrastructure was necessary. So it was for their own needs, as uh, one of our panelists yeah, we, put. We, we, got, we had that point out earlier on. Yeah, I'm, what, we haven't got a lot of time, but so come, yeah, come to your point what, quickly. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm coming to is the, also the social engineering that we talked about uh, earlier is, was not given by the British. It was by all the social engineers like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, uh, uh, people like Gandhi, Ambedkar. They, they, uh, they are the ones who did uh, that. Okay. We have, we have also, very short run. We have also talked... We have also very quickly, not, please. We have also not talked about famines. In we have talked about famines. We, but, we, we have talked about famines. Oh, and Jones. No, I just think uh, that point you made about race and racism is just is critical because obviously to justify empire, people who were being colonised were dehumanised. They had to be seen as inferior because you wouldn't possibly allow for that sort of behaviour to be conducted against people you would see as being like yourself. And that legacy scars our society today. But just finally, I do think the worry is I have are people going to watch this and go, oh, you're all just castigating Britain, it's a big British, anti-British hate fest. And the truth is, what frightens me is in our curriculum in schools across the country, what we're not seeing is the history we should be proud of that I spoke about before. People of all backgrounds and, and faiths uh, who fought for our rights and freedoms. Are you proud of Churchill? I'm proud of the British war effort against the Nazis, of the people, service people who went to Europe. They say he had, uh, and it's yeah. argued he had racially supremacist attitudes. He did. Yeah, well, of course, the people who ran <laughs> the would British you, Empire. Would you like to take his statue down, Churchill? Would you like, would you like his statue down? Churchill's statue down. In the long run, I think having a statue of someone who called, um, who called, Afri he said Indians were ghastly people with a ghastly religion. The famine was their own fault because they bred like rabbits. He said, is, he said many is, things, is, Churchill. Is, 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 is ultimately, ultimately would you like to... The, the statue I'm not going to make a comment on that because I'll be dragged through the Daily Mail tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, just to make your point on the... Um, on the oh, you said Chinese rape of African resources. Yeah. As if... Shell was not a British Dutch company, was not yeah. paying Still the Nigerian happening. government to suppress protesters in 1990. I'm very proud that we are now a diverse society Chinese. and we can build We can build on it and go forward. That's and is that, is that for you? What is the positive legacy? What can people well, look at and remember? Does, is there anything about the empire that still binds us together, Rose? I think Commonwealth for me is a good thing. And I am glad that you gave us cricket and that we... And I'm talking with my Caribbean hats on. That I and, gave and, you cricket. <laughs> yes, and look what we're doing with it. <laughs> look how terrific we are. But, uh, but I'm also <laughs> glad that right here in Britain, we can be a truly... We're not, we're not fully there yet. We need to work at it. We need to work at better being, being a better, diverse and multi-ethnic, multicultural society. You're, celebrating there, there, each other. There are three, th th three enduring legacies that, that we can be proud of. We've left liberal, we spread liberal capitalism around the world to the annoyance of some. We shared a form of government which in many ways still continues. And last but by no means least, 450 million people speak English with, uh, and in some oh, regards, what, 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 what a wonderful legacy as well. And so there's lots to be proud of. <laughs> We've heard lots of grievance, grievance mongery going on. Andrea, lots to be Andrea, proud of. You, wait, Andrea, you have the very last word, uh, and it's a quick one. Well, they only need to speak English today as the global lingua franca, precisely because we did colonise half of the world. And proud of that. <laughs> Which is a good thing. That's not it's called an achievement. It's not, it's not a an achievement. Well, English is not a very cultured language, I'd say. I mean, I speak English to my Listen, first language. we did a Shakespeare special a few weeks oh, ago. Oh, yeah, so but let's just, you know, when I speak to my kids, I have to constantly tell them, you've got to speak to elders with a bit more respect because English does not have that verb left anymore for yeah. adults, which French has. And it's not a good thing. You know, it's it not was, a good it thing. A that, time, it is an achievement, but it's not a great achievement. It's actually about, a very negative achievement. About immigration. They, we are here because we're you finished, went Rose. there. We're finished, Rose. The <laughs> okay. sun will never set on the big questions. Thank you very much for watching. See you later.